Thank you, Robert. Yes, okay, I, I apologize in advance. This is going to be a little bit unprepared because I changed the subject of my talk in the last minute. Uh, because, well, the original talk was about whole movement, Hamiltonian flows, and it, I realized it would have been a little bit dry and hard to, hard to digest. So uh, I came up with the idea of talking about some recent joint work with Basil and Glenn. And you know what? The, the, the question you want is, but if you use the French spelling, actually, Glenn, Maurice, Basil, is Caspar, Melker, three wise men. And all the time, all the time who came from Ethiopia, I think, was the wisest. <laughs> well, that must be more than a coincidence. Good, okay, so it's lunch time now, so I'm going to introduce a menu. We start with Fermi's trick. It's a trick that Fermi actually came with in 1930, in a largely forgotten paper. Really, it's very mathematically, it's, it's, it's so trivial, it's so simple. See that? It's a relation with Bohm's potential. Then the main dish, internal energy and Schrodinger's equation. This internal energy idea is due to bands this inside, okay. and then some quantum dollops as I deserve. Well, actually, we call them quantum blobs. I, I don't remember whether it was Basil or I who came. Should we not name? argue about that? Yeah, yeah, don't shout out. But then they call them quantum dollops because a rock doesn't like quantum dollops. Yes, I'm full of my experiments. There's something more than control the blob. Do you think the green one? I'll show you a picture of a blob in a moment. Anyway, you might have well, it's quantum now. Okay, so references here are the two papers that we published, both in physics letters, here last year, well, last year and this year, and I think that we uh, should publish another one in a more comprehensive, because there are still open questions. So, what is all this about? Okay, first let me say that my collaboration with Basil has lasted many years ago, 15 or 16 years already, and we Skype quite often. Never on Saturdays. Yeah, no, never on Saturdays, Basil, because... Oh, because that's my home. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay, so in the first year, this is Basil phone in the Prato Park in Vienna. <laughs> Often the feedback is not very good because that we often strongly disagrees. This is a Skype picture here. Of course, oh no. Most of the time it still agrees with me. Okay, let's go over to see things. So, how does the whole story start? I assume that I have a particle or an entity with mass m, which is represented not by a point as in classical physics, but by a wave function, which I write in polar form. Psi naught equal R naught, positive number, can be zero, but I won't discuss too much what happens when R naught can be equal to zero, and then in terms of phase factor. That's the polar decomposition here of the wave function. Now, <laughs> Fermi observed in a paper in 1930 that this wave function, or this function of psi, oh, it should be psi naught here, I should, satisfies this equation always. This is a trivial mathematical identity. Hmm. Actually, if you want to prove it, you can start like this here. You notice, okay, that R naught, the real part of the wave function, satisfies the last equation here. And that's a triviality, because if you multiply it by R naught, you get here x squared the second derivative, if you assume that n is equal to 1, minus h, x squared times the second derivative. So this is such a reality, of course, satisfied by any function which has those twice continuously differentiable. Okay, I will not insist too much on the mathematical uh, details here, we're talking about physics, so uh, we assume that all conditions are realized. Now, if you perform a gauge transformation, you can put this equation here this for, but on the other hand, you don't even have to involve gauge transformations because by performing calculations by hand, you see that psi and mold in the sense of this equation. But you can see it in two different ways. I think that, remember where the first paper, he actually 
make the full calculations. But that's just a matter of taste. And it's remarkable because, because why? Here you see that you have a, a phase factor of kinetic energy. Yeah? And here is something which really looks like the quantum potential that we will sign. And this does not pop out from physics, it's just a mathematical fact. It's very clear, but still it deserves, I think, some attention. So let's see a little bit here. Right, okay. So Fermi next observes that the operator here, which I call which you know, H hat F. F of Fermi is the quantization in any reasonable quantization scheme, you can take Weilborn and Jordan or Schrödinger quantization scheme, is the quantization of this Hamiltonian function here. But, well, that's obvious, you just have to put hats here. Yes. Uh, I said something which is not quite true. It's the quantization of this in either Weil quantization or born German quantization. There might be some more exotic quantization schemes which do not yield this. But, okay, yes. Let's not uh, just go so many details here. So, we have an operator which appears quite naturally when considering a wave function, a complex function, yeah? and this leads us to a Hamiltonian function here. Yeah? And what Fermi does ultimately is to identify the particle or the entity represented by the wave function psi by the surface or hypersurface HF equal to zero. What happens is actually that Fermi starts with that wave function and associates this wave function, a phase space function, and then a phase space surface or hypersurface. Uh, there are other ways of representing wave functions by phase space objects. You have the Wigner transform, for instance. And funnily enough, but I'm not going to show it here, if you start with a Gaussian, with a Gaussian wave function, then up to a factor the Wigner transform and the Fermi Hamiltonian are identical. And this is something that could also be exploited a little bit much. This, uh, this was remarked by Benendi and Strini to uh, Italian physicists. Okay, so here are some, some words here. So there is considered the hypersurface sigma f hf equal to zero. And assume that this hypersurface it's an energy shell, this is, okay? Bounds a phase space at omega f. That is, well, I assume that it's not open anywhere, that it's really something which is compact and closed. If Fermi identified omega f, but Fermi worked in dimension n equal to 1, that is, essentially with curves, not with phase space sets. Uh, but the generalization is, of course, straightforward. Yeah. So Fermi identifies omega f with one particle, right? But the, Wave function psi naught. Well, okay, um, and this is a little bad. We made an insight here which is uh, very interesting. I mm -hmm. show that this identification is comparable with the uncertainty principle. I'm going to talk about the uncertainty principle in a moment. Yeah, also. Okay. Because, of course, in quantum mechanics, the notion of a point-like particle does not make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense in classical mechanics neither, because, well, I uh, read some paper by Jeremy Butterfield actually against pointillism, and uh, he also makes point clear that you know, these, these concept points are just mathematical representation, but this is clear. I think that Jeremy Butterfield was supposed to come, but he couldn't do it. And, uh, <coughs> yeah. So, the set omega f is can be viewed as a blow up of a point. Okay? It can't be point-like because of the uncertainty principle, but it's a blow up of something. This already introduces the idea of coarse graining of phase space here. Okay, in fact, the smallest entity unfolded from a point allowed by the uncertainty principle. You said that that's it. <laughs> Yay. Or second, yes. You said it. Mm -hmm. You wrote it. <laughs> okay. And of course, this blow up requires energy, and this energy is precisely the quantum potential. Because if you put the quantum <coughs> potential equal to zero, so everything reduces just to a single point here. So we can view that 
what the potential here, uh, the internal energy associated with one particle, whose total energy is then kinetic energy plus the potential energy plus plus the quantum potential energy here. And of course, both kinetic energy and the quantum potential are internal energy as opposed to the potential energy which comes from the outside. Good. Fine. Okay, <laughs> let's consider the case of a re rebound state. Well, in this case, we have an equation like this, which is given to us. Okay? Yes, Did you just move slightly when you're pointing, because I can't quite see it. Sorry, I'm talking about you. Okay. <laughs> okay. To move we don't have a pointer, I guess, do we? There was a pointer. Yeah, the There's a pointer somewhere. Oh, it screws over. Okay. Sorry, mate. I'm using that. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, suppose we are given a classical, so to say, quantum problem here. We've got a Schrodinger equation, a stationary Schrodinger equation, time-independent Schrodinger equation. Okay. But since on the other hand, in view of what we have said, we also have this equation here, so I know it satisfies both equations here, then by subtracting them, you see that the total energy is given by the sum of the potential energy and the Bohm potential. Yeah, okay. E here is the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenfunction psi naught. All this is, of course, totally trivial. You don't have to. Yes? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay. hence the classical force, which is given by minus the gradient of the potential and the quantum force summed up to zero, they balance each other. Totally balance each other. And I think that uh, this is an essential point in what we did. More or less. I mean, it's funny because starting from the mathematical triviality, which is Fermi's equation, I mean, that's something that a first year undergraduate student or even a zero year undergraduate student could, could do. I mean, this is just a trivial reformulation or something. Leads to some kind of insight here. More about that in a little moment here. Okay? Fine. Now, Schrodinger's equation. Uh, so far, we have only been considering a stationary wave function. I didn't introduce time in all this. I just take to, um, a static <coughs> object, but we can also introduce time. And we are actually able to derive Schrodinger's equation. You know, there are, mathematically, there are several ways, at least two ways, to derive Schrodinger's equation. One of them is rather technical and rejected by most physicists, not by Basel, fortunately enough, is to use the metaplectic representation, the metaplectic group, this uh, double covering group of the symplectic group, and then you start with quadratic Hamiltonians. If you take a quadratic Hamiltonian, the flow, the Hamiltonian flow, consists of linear method, symplectic matrices. Good. But the symplectic group has a double covering group actually covering groups of all orders, but the double covering group is very interesting because it can be represented faithfully as a group of unitary operators. So now if you take the Hamiltonian path generated by a quadratic Hamiltonian, using elementary fiber bundle theory, you can lift that path to the metaplectic group. So you obtain a path of unitary operators, and this path is just a propagator for the corresponding quantum Hamiltonian. So, uh, actually, well, you, you don't deduce quantum mechanics from that. For, to deduce a new physical theory, you need a physical assumption. But you deduce Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation follows trivially from the theory of the metaplectic group. And then it can be extended, like we did a couple of years ago, to arbitrary flow. But that's another story, and that's what I didn't really want to talk about today, because just to pronounce it's a little bit too, too heavy. And here's another way of deducing then uh, Schrodinger's equation. It's a little bit perhaps more physical than using the, the theory of the metaplectic group, but it does as follows. Good. We form a Hamiltonian function. Kinetic energy plus potential energy plus the Bohm potential. I define this here. 
So the velocity here. Uh, Ux, the, the point of the flange of Girard, as a bar we used, using yesterday. No, sorry, I want to ask a non-trivial question now. Um, yes. I mean, is it a bit misleading writing Q of X of T in the same form as V of X of, of T? Because they're not functions in... Q is not a kind of potential in space-time, is it? Yes. Oh, it is? Yes. yes. If you have multiple parts. I, I did. What I did, I did write well, no, the short. variable T. The variable T is always present. Because if you take the Psi, not the Psi naught, the Psi, depending on T also, then the quantum, quantum potential also automatically binds. And you worry about configuration space. Aha, uh -huh. OK. I see. I see, I see. I see. But wouldn't that be the, isn't that where people... No, but, well, even, even in the, 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 when, you, when you write down the quantum potential, yeah. in the usual way, time is always present. Yeah. Because the amplitude, R, depends on time anyway. I didn't include time here in what I said just before. Well, okay, in this case, there's no time, of course, when we're in a stationary state. But if you go back to what I said here, well, I wrote psi naught equal to, I didn't include time, but I could have said, okay, this is at time t. Hmm. So if I add that t here to make psi naught depend on t, this also depends on t, this also depends on t, and ultimately, this also depends on t. So, well, okay, if you don't like the time, I can just remove it. But quantum potential is always, I think, time dependent, at least when you have a, a time dependent state. And that's when one of the reasons for which, when you study the Hamiltonian mechanics associated with, the, with Bohm's potential, you have to consider time dependent Hamiltons from the very beginning because they will appear anyway. See? Well, I know that many people object to the, to the fact that Bohmian mechanics or whatever we should call it <coughs> is a Hamiltonian mechanics. Mm -hmm. Mathematically speaking, it is. Point. That's all. But then what the interpretations are, that's another problem. Okay? This here, yes, okay, so I have it here. So now I define a phase phi by writing the Hamilton Jacobi equation corresponding to this Hamiltonian. This is the classical Hamiltonian function. You just substitute the gradient of phi for V here, and that's it. You know, the Hamilton, Hamilton Jacobi equation it was one of the first methods used actually to solve explicitly many Hamiltonian problems. It's a difficult the question to solve explicitly. So I think it's more a theoretical tool than a practical tool, but in this case it plays a very important role of what. Well, the best way to understand Hamilton's Jacobi theory is to use actually subjective geometry and the theory of Lagrangian planes and Lagrangian manifolds. If you do that, then you, you also see why caustics occur and all that. I mean, the caustics do not exist anyway. I mean, Caustics are not, uh, they are frame dependent. But okay, that's another story. I promise I'm trying not to make things too complicated. Then, okay, <coughs> we made the following assumption that rho, that is the modulus squared of the wave from psi, represents the probability density, which is consistent with Gleason's theorem. You are perhaps familiar with Gleason's theorem. Uh, Gleason's theorem uh, theorem motivates. In the case n larger or equal to 3 Born's rule, okay, you can do it using many, uh, many uh, uh, physical interpretations, but we accept it here. And conserva conservation of probability, which we also postulate here, which seems to be quite reasonable, <coughs> leads to the continuity equation, and which can be rewritten this way here. But hey, now we are finished. Well, we have the hamilton jacobi equation now, we have the continuity equation, and both together are equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. So the last step is trivial because both formulations are equivalent. Of course, of course we have to be a little careful that uh, with the zeros of psi, uh, 
this of R and all that, but uh, I dismiss this here because I want to keep things simple. So, you see, we have introduced here the quantum potential not in an ad hoc way. It appears automatically using Fermi's idea, and then we realize that, of course, you might object that all this is a little bit far fetched, but no, well, you can't disprove the argument, of course. No, but <laughs> no, what I mean here is actually that there's one clever way of deducing Schrödinger's equation directly here. Because if you, if you, what happens if you neglect the quantum potential from the beginning, and if you if you say that, mm, okay, uh, just work with the classical Hamiltonian, it's a moment of the Q equal to zero. And then you can, of course, again, here say that, okay, we have a probability current and so on, and we can write the continuity equation, and then what you get is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But if you do the calculations with Q equal to zero from the beginning, it will reappear here anyway. It will appear here. You will get that Q psi term here. And this was a non nonlinear one of the calculations a long time ago, actually. And so, okay. Okay, now to the hard part of this. So far, the mathematics has been very simple. Okay, quantum blobs. Rob, that's for you. <laughs> well, that's called, I think, a, a, a blobfish. It's supposed to be the ugliest fish on earth. I don't know. It's sweet, actually. Here. <laughs> okay, quantum blob. So, what is a quantum blob? Okay. First, in the plane, if you assume that n is equal to 1, well, let's take a closed curve of a certain, certain surface. And I call it a quantum blob if it has an area at least equal to 1 half of h. More generally, I mean, no, it's a little more general in the case n equal to 1. In the plane, actually, you can view a quantum blob, that is any surface with area equal to 1 half of h, as the deformation of a disk with area, area 1 half of h by a canonical transformation, alias symplectic transformation. Because symplectic transformations are area preserving. Okay? while you have to assume some kind of smoothness of the boundary. More general, in the case of a n-dimensional configuration space, a quantum blob is what you get by deforming a ball with, with radius square root of h bar by a canonical transformation, linear or not. So, it's something, well, well the fact that you can do that. Well, at least here. Okay, a quantum blob, sorry, yes, we did a remark. It follows from Liu Wilstia theorem that a quantum blob will have the same volume as the original ball with radius square root of h bar. But we have actually something more uh, uh, the notion of symplectic capacity, which might not be uh, familiar to everyone. It's a complicated notion. Notion of symplectic capacity goes back to Gromov's uh, theorem on the non squeezing property of symplectic maps in 1985. And actually, he was awarded for, for this discovery and, and other discoveries uh, the, the Abel Prize two, two years or three years ago, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Mathematics. And it's not the Field Medal, it's just the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Mathematics. So the Field Medal is only for beginners who don't be the age of 40. <laughs> well, anyway, so I'm not going to insist too much on the notion of subjective capacity here. Uh, I'm just going to talk about deformations of balls of square, the radius square root of h bar, by canonical transformation, linear or not. Fine. Quantum blocks lead to face space <coughs> pointillism. Well, this is a painting. Sorry? I picture. Yes, it's your picture. I started from you. No, did you? Oh, I thought it was Signac who did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we discussed it. I think you pointed out the picture. You said, "Pardon me," but I'm moving now with your permission. I saw. Yes, well, face space is made of 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 quantum blobs. Actually, 
Still, 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 this is not totally, totally true in a sense, because, yeah, okay, I'm motivated down the introduction of the quantum blobs, blobs, in blobs, not it. Okay, now consider the covariance matrix of a quantum system. Well, if you've got a mixed state that is a, a, a I call that a density operator or a pure state, you can always associate it with a covariance matrix. You do it exactly as you do it for classical mechanics. Well, for instance, in case n equal to 1, the covariance matrix will just reduce this matrix here. The deltas are the covariances, which make the correlations between the x and bx, or y and by, and so on. And, and it is well known that the uncertainty principle, the determinacy principle, I think that could be better to say, can be written this way. Hmm? This is the Robertson Schrödinger inequality, which implies, as a particular case, the Heisenberg inequality. But it's always better to use the Robertson Schrödinger inequalities because these are symplectically invariant, whereas the Heisenberg inequalities are not. Uh, this is due to the fact that if we, if we employ the whole covariance matrix, it has to satisfy a certain condition, which is this one here. You see, the Robertson Schrödinger inequalities are equivalent to this very simple condition. What does it mean? It means that if you add the covariance matrix to I H bar over n times the standard symplectic matrix, then it must be positive semi-definite. What does it mean? It means that if you calculate the eigenvalues of this here, they will never be negative. They are real because this matrix here is actually uh, Hermitian. Region. If you take the adjoint to what happens, this is symmetric, nothing happens. Here you get the minus i, and here you get the transpose of j. The transpose of j is minus j, so nothing happens. Hence, the eigenvalues are real, and this condition just means that the eigenvalues are real. If you make some calculations, then you see that this condition is precisely equal to the Robertson Schrodinger inequality. Now this is a symplectic, uh, it's a very concise symplectic reformulation of the uncertainty principle or the indeterminacy principle. Now, this implies that if we, if we study the, the, the covariance ellipsoid, which is defined by this here, then this here is equivalent to the condition omega c contains a quantum block. This is how the concurrent blobs are associated with the uncertainty principle. Okay, so this is all the work of mine and the okay, foundations of physics. And there's also a physics report with my colleague Hans Lueff, a physics report from four years ago, where this is analyzed. Now, one thing here which makes me feel discomfortable. You see, the Robertson Schrödinger inequality, uncertainty <laughs> principle, it's expressed in terms of variances and covariances, which are very ad hoc ways actually of measuring uh, indeterminacy or errors. Uh, actually, it's really, it works really very well if you have Gaussian states, but otherwise, I mean, it's arbitrary. Why use just delta x or delta b and not some other measure? So, I mean, to use the covariance uh, matrix is pretty conventional. Why? Well, in classical physics, you don't know how it works, probably also in quantum mechanics. But the Fermi, the Fermi stuff leads to something perhaps simpler. Okay, so back to Fermi here. Recall that this equation defines here a hypersurface here, yeah, which we identified with a quantum state. We now assume that this hypersurface is the boundary of a phase space set omega f, like we did a moment ago. Yeah. Then we make the following conjecture. The Fermi set omega f will always contain a quantum block. So far, we have been able to prove it for the case n equal to 1 using exact quantization conditions here. In the general case, it hasn't been done. I know it will work for the potentials which are radially symmetric. For instance, for the hydrogen atom, I can prove that this is also true. 
A general relax, uh, I think it's not so simple, but it must be done, <laughs> or it has to be done at least. So this is a uh, work in progress actually. The thing is that, for, to me, the Fermi set appears to be much more natural actually than a quantum law, which is, as I said, conven conventional, a conventional measure of uncertainty. Here we have really for every given wave function, we have Set. Well, yeah, I call it a Fermi log. Well, is it a day? No. <laughs> but, so this is true. This conjecture is true in case n equal to 1. Because the Fermi set contains a surface with area equal to 1 to 1 half of h, because you can show actually if it's n equal to 1, you have a line across the curve. And you can show that the integral of pdx along that line is larger or equal to one half of h using some exact quantization conditions <coughs> which exist. In the high dimension is not, it's not yet known, but it will be very interesting to prove that in the higher dimensions we have quantum blocks which are automatically contained in this Fermi set here. So, <laughs> well, these things are perhaps very simple, but there are unexpected difficulties and problems that deserve to be solved. The, the problems like this one here are not necessarily so simple. Hmm. Okay, so that was it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>